Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, 2012, President Barack Obama gave an interview in which he affirmed his support for gay marriage, something that he'd not really done publicly up until that point. And the reason he was saying that on this day was, well, because a couple days earlier, his vice president, Joe Biden, had kind of let slip in an interview that maybe he and the president had kind of sort of now maybe they supported gay marriage. Biden said that he was, quote, absolutely comfortable with the idea of men marrying men and women marrying women. And then in that interview, realizing that maybe he had gotten a little bit out over his skis, he tried to contextualize it. He was like, oh, you know, I'm just the vice president. I don't set policy. What do I know? But the cat was out of the bag, I suppose, and President Obama then had to scramble and respond by being much clearer about his stance than he had been up to that point. So let's talk about this Biden slip of the tongue, how key of a moment it was in the long battle for marriage equality in this country, and who better to join us to do that than Sasha Eisenberg, journalist and author of The Engagement, America's Quarter Century Struggle Over Same-Sex Marriage. Sasha also teaches in the political science department at UCLA. But Sasha, thanks for uh, coming on. This is great to have you. I'm really pleased to be here with you all. Thanks. And here, as always, are Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, before we get to the gaff slip of the tongue, out of your skis, which is the phrase that Obama used, um, Sasha, do you want to give context for the line that the Obama administration and Joe Biden, I suppose, as part of that administration, was trying to walk between gay marriage, civil unions. Obama talked about how his personal views were evolving, but that was somehow distinct from the his policy views or even his ability to enact policy. Kind of what's the picture and all the various threads and fine lines that are floating in this moment? Yeah, you know, by uh, the time they come to power in, in 2009, both Obama and Biden are in the same place that basically all ambitious national Democrats are which is that they say that they support civil unions because they do not believe that gay and lesbian couples should be denied the same rights as opposite sex couples, but that they believe that marriage should not be changed. And and Obama in 2008 at some points cited a, a sort of religious basis that it was contrary to his, his Christian beliefs. But it was the consensus view. It's where the Clintons were. It's where John Kerry was. It was where John Edwards was um, during their national campaigns. And it was, you know, the emergence of civil unions in 2000 in Vermont. It sort of created the third side in a two-sided issue. And for Democrats who were balancing the fact that same-sex marriage was still unpopular with a majority of voters during that time, but the fact that they had a coalition that was increasingly reliant on uh, gay and lesbian support for votes, for money, you know, large part of the Democratic donor base were especially gay men, and for volunteer activist support, it, it was sort of untenable for them to be anti-gay. And what the bizarre thing that happened over the course of that decade was that um, that turned out to be a very persuasive argument. Hmm. Uh, a plurality position in a lot of polls showed uh, support for civil unions over either uh, changing marriage laws or um, uh, keeping same-sex couples totally unrecognized. And so that's where Obama and Biden find themselves coming to office in, in, in 2009. And over the course of their first term, public opinion shifts, and all of a sudden it becomes really unmanageable to be the heads of the Democratic Party going into a re-election campaign, um, leading a party that has become a pro marriage equality party as opponents of it. And being in that kind of liminal space between supporting marriage equality and supporting civil unions meant that the Obama administration, even Obama's election, it was it was all this this period of tensions and fault lines and sometimes difficult to understand decision making within the new administration. Um, so you have in the early days of the administration, the Department of Justice is not only still defending the Defense of Marriage Act, but is using arguments like you know, this is like bestiality, which is illegal, um, which was a, a point of real tension. There was a kind of slow rolling of the repeal of don't ask, don't tell. Um, at the same time, there was work within the administration to make sure that same sex couples had visitation rights at hospitals and had the kind of um, federal protections that could be extended to them without violating the Defense of Marriage Act. 
Yeah, I mean, so the question that, you know, polls ask, right, which is like, do you support or oppose the right of same-sex couples to marry, is not actually a question many, if any, people got asked in the United States during that period. You know, voters in almost three dozen states got asked, do you want to amend your state constitution Mm -hmm. to prohibit same-sex marriage? Um, There were uh, legislatures, a few legislatures where they voted on, on changing the laws. But the questions that were before Joe Biden as a senator and Barack Obama as a senator were, do you want to amend the federal constitution to ban same-sex marriage? Uh, they were opposed to that. Um, they didn't have to ever cast a vote on changing marriage laws. Uh, Obama did an unusual thing as a candidate in 2008. He came out against Proposition 8, which was a state-level constitutional amendment in California. It's unusual for a presidential candidate to weigh in on state-level ballot measures. So they they had weighed in on this issue, but the binary question of do you support marriage equality or not is just not something that comes in front of the president of the United States. There wasn't going to be legislation about it. This wasn't going to be settled by executive uh, order. And the question that was coming before them as as, as Nicole suggest most urgently was, will your Justice Department defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court? And this is, you know, the the, the standing expectation is that the Justice Department dis- defends existing statutes against constitutional challenge. Uh, and the problem that they had politically was that the things that people, state governments, mm-hmm. uh, typically said in court to defend their gay marriage bans were incredibly unpalatable within the Democratic coalition because they sounded anti-gay. And so the, the administration discovered rather early that it, it really could not sustain mounting the type of legal defense, constitutional defense, that they would have to do for legal reasons. They couldn't sustain that politically. And Obama indicates in the summer of 2009 to his White House counsel's office after the initial backlash to, to one of these Justice Department filings, hey, I want to. I would love to be able to not defend this law in court anymore. He ran as an opponent of the Defense of Marriage Act. He said that he wouldn't, that he wanted to sign a bill that would repeal it. But he told the lawyers, you have to find me a way there. And, um, I need to get there on on legal and constitutional grounds, and ultimately they did. And that was a the the administration approached announcing that they would not defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court with real trepidation. They thought that there would be significant political backlash to it, um, uh, both on sort of procedural grounds. Why are you picking this one law not to defend? And also because you know, most Democratic politicians of the 2000s stepped very gingerly around yeah. gay rights issues. And they were surprised when they did that in early 2011, that it hardly got any attention. And uh, the Republican Congress said, we'll defend the law in court. And it ended up being something that, that did not get a lot of public scrutiny, but had a lot of legal impact, because now you had the U.S. government saying, we actually don't think that this law is constitutional. And that, that has some some standing with courts. Is Biden sort of uh, making typical gaffes in Biden's style as he as he seems to do, like just sort of, you know, speaking out of turn? Or, you know, is there a a thought that maybe he's trying to maybe not trying to intentionally undermine President Obama? But like, what was the, um, I guess, motivation behind him sort of giving this statement? And was he aware of of the fallout that would happen with him saying this even though he tries to you know like clean it up but <laughs> in even, real time <laughs> yeah, yeah i know <laughs> i'm just the vice president <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so you know so for the better part of a year the obama white house had been trying to move to a situation where they could announce his switch on policy so it's in early 2011 that the Justice Department uh, decides not to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. That political reception encourages them that they can move forward on this. Um, Obama has a moment that I, I write about in some detail in my book where he goes to New York uh, for a um, DNC fundraiser. Uh, he does two fundraisers, one normal fundraiser and then one gay and lesbian fundraiser, which happens to be include a performance of Sister Act 2 on Broadway. Um, these are the important historical details that need to be maintained for the record. Um, but he gets heckled at his own fundraiser mm. by um, New York gay activists for, you know, being um, on the wrong side of the marriage issue. And Obama is really hurt by this, in part because at that moment, 
New York gay activists are celebrating Andrew Cuomo, who's then the governor who made one of his first priorities coming into office, um, pushing a bill through the legislature. And I think it's a really unpleasant place for Obama to be on on the wrong side of of sort of liberal activists on a civil rights issue. And he's really bitter about it. Um, I, I quote Dan Pfeiffer, who's a White House communications director, saying he felt like the skunk at the garden party. New York's really excited. They legalized marriage through the political process and Obama's getting heckled. And so they start a process to announce him changing his position. But they, you know, they recognize there's a lot of scrutiny. It's going to be a- attacked as opportunistic by everybody, um, potentially. And so they have to figure out when they decide they want to do it before the reelection, that the political upside is greater than the political downside. Um, but how do you do this? You know, it's, it's not a, I changed my view on like, should the debt ceiling, you know, be extended a week or something. This is a thing where people want, would want to hear some heartfelt description discussion in the in the Obama mythology that speech he gave in Philadelphia about race in 2008 like um is pretty significant and there was some sense that he needs to give some explanation about this evolution he had talked about for years and so they're basically looking at the election year and they make a decision we don't want it to be too late we don't want this to overshadow the debates are getting in the way of the conventions. We still want to run against Mitt Romney as a you know nasty plutocrat. We don't want this to be an election about sexual politics. So they settle on this idea that that in ultimately in early June of 2012 there will be an opening when he can do this. They decide the probably the best place to do it is on the View. There's a bunch of research that suggests that <laughs> um, that finds its way to the White House that suggests that the uh, cross tabs uh, show that the-, <laughs> the, cross, the the research shows that it's better if a woman, a female interviewer, interlocutor uh, is having a conversation with him about this. He's going to talk about how his daughters and and their friends, parents shaped his his views on this. I, I don't know if any of the research said that four female interviewers are, right. are better than one, but. Um, <laughs> The plan is he's going to go to New York for another fundraiser in June. They will set up a time on The View, and they'll sort of tee it up so that he can talk with the ladies about about that he's changed his view. And but my reporting shows that Biden was aware of the general contours of this plan, if not the specifics. They had lunch every week. Um, uh, Biden had, had exhibited a little bit of hesitation. He sort of saw himself as like the guardian of, of the president's relationship with Catholics. Um, he had been on a few Obamacare related things dealing with Catholic hospitals as sort of, you know, had, had been a voice of conservatism on those things. He was aware of the general plans. Um, my understanding is nobody believes some people inside the White House who were protective of Obama, including Valerie Jarrett, you know, definitely blamed him for this and thought it was undermining. But I don't think anybody thinks that it was it was tactical. And there were people are purposeful and people around Biden were not in the immediate aftermath, not entirely sure and or in denial of the fact that he had necessarily said anything that substantively differed from um, from Obama's stated view at that point. But that's obviously not how the world heard it. You're used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. Nikki, I know you want to jump in because you've probably done this with the Obama Oral History Project, too. You've, you've visited this moment. But just to lay out the sort of exact words that Biden says in that moment, David Gregory, you know, basically his his question is to Biden, you're comfortable with same sex marriage now? And Biden says, look, I'm vice president of the United States. The president sets the policy, but I am absolutely comfortable with the fact that men marrying men, women marrying women and heterosexual men marrying women are entitled to the exact same rights all the civil rights, all the civil liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see much of a distinction beyond that. And then it becomes a whole thing. The White House 
issues a statement saying the vice president was saying what the president has said previously, that committed and loving same sex sex couples deserve the same rights and protections enjoyed by all Americans. We oppose efforts to roll that back. They talk about the Defense of Marriage Act and they say the vice president was expressing that he, too, is evolving on the issue after meeting so many committed couples and families in this country. Hmm. So uh, I just wanted to get that sort of statement and response and and. I would say very unconvincing reframing <laughs> out there. But uh, Nikki, what do you what do you think about this moment? Well, and just in the in the in the few days between when Biden makes this statement, which does land as a, a kind of of bombshell, right? The, the, this this is a member of the administration, a high ranking member of the administration, vice president of the United States, saying he's not saying I'm comfortable with civil unions. He's saying I'm okay with men marrying men and women marrying women, and it does put the White House in a very difficult situation. You can tell in the language that you just read, Jody, but also like the poor press secretary who has to field questions um, at the next press junket just repeatedly says, I have no updates on the president's views on this issue. People keep asking because they they want him to say something. Um, And it does give the appearance, even though this had been long planned um, and delayed, I think, to President Obama's frustration, right, that they hadn't quite found the time to say it yet. Um, Now it really there was no other way to make it not look like he was scrambling to catch up with the vice president, because it's a hastily put together interview um, when he finally goes on air to make his own statement, um, which is also kind of a... It's like, sure, sure, fine. kind of stilted (laughs) statement. I'm going to go ahead and and say that, yeah, I'm for this. But they don't... Yeah, so so they don't... They don't wait for that Mm -hmm. New York visit and the view. They scramble and they call up um, Robin Roberts and Mm -hmm. ABC and they do an interview, I think, a few days later on Good Morning America, where then Obama says, (laughs) I've just concluded that for me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and affirm that I think same sex couples should be able to get married. I mean, it's like you can see. Obama disassociating himself from himself in yeah. that moment and just talking about himself as like a I third know. party. I'm there. just concluded. So Let me just go ahead. Yeah, you know yeah. what? <laughs> Now's the a good time. person named Barack Obama <laughs> should do this thing. Yeah. Um, and, and Sasha, is is it correct that Robin Roberts at the time wasn't publicly out yet? Did the mm. Obama administration know that she was gay? My understanding is that she was not publicly out, but... Um, it was the research. She was out to her friends, but not mm-hmm. to the public or, you know, so the distinction was somewhere there. But but I believe it was done with some understanding that that she would be a, a friendly interviewer on this. But, um, uh, you know, yeah. So they, they went for a couple of days trying to hold that line of there's nothing different here. And there's no real way once people reject the say, no, they're saying different things because either Obama is letting his vice president undermine him in public uh, and, uh, you know, doesn't know how to run his own ship or he's, you know, letting Biden dog whistle to his base and not willing to own it himself. It it became the punditry was like, however people read it, there was no good way to have it. And so by the, you know, third news cycle uh, after this, um, it became clear that they needed to do. And what they did was what they were going to do basically a month later with slightly different staging and atmospherics. And obviously, um, it looked reactive in the moment. But uh, But, but, my guess is that the... Yeah, go ahead. No, but I'm I'm curious, though, because you you mentioned the various ways in which it got interpreted, but you didn't kind of... You know, was there not part of part of this that was just like oh that's biden being biden that's a gaffe and sort of like i mean Mm because i seem to you know maybe through just my lens but seem to remember this as kind of like the fact that some people at least were treating it as an innocuous gaffe i think was an indicator that as you pointed out a number of times like maybe the obama administration was lagging behind public sentiment that this wasn't that that this played as a gaffe was an indicator that this maybe wasn't that momentous of a thing to be saying out loud no i mean i think it was treated as uh a big deal um and you know it's i think that the administration was wary of undercutting by in private uh folks are incredibly harsh on biden within obama's circle on the campaign and in the white house but they're going into a re-election year doing the joe biden just spouts on i think they'd worked very hard over four years to establish him as like responsible elder statesman and it couldn't be the official line of the white house that our vice president just 
blab stuff out um, because he can't control his mouth. Um, I, I don't think that was sort of a sustainable uh, explanation, so, which is why they were stuck in this, like, saying that, no, there's nothing to see here, uh, when, when very clearly there was. But hanging over all of this was that there was no policy change that was going to happen, regardless mm-hmm. of what yeah. either Obama mm-hmm. or Biden mm-hmm. said. So it wasn't it wasn't that Obama said, we're not going to sign the bill, and Biden said, oh, actually, I would sign the bill, and it's like, oh, now we're, does this mean you're going to sign the bill? It's the next day, administration policy is the exact same. Um, yeah. You know, not, n- a lot changed politically, but nothing immediately changed in terms of, of, of policy. That's why I think it's so interesting that Biden in that moment said, the president sets policy, but I believe because it, it was creating a moral distance between him and the administration's policy in a way that I think I imagine would have been unbearable mm. for Barack Obama. Yeah, I mean, look, they could have been saying for three years, hey, there's nothing a president can do to set marriage laws that's set by the states. I have my own private views and I'm not going to, I don't think that's a, a public matter, yeah, but right? Feels, uh, that, that, that could have been. It feels just like, you know, how people are like, my retweets are not endorsements or whatever. Th- that's what this feels <laughs> right, like. Right. You know, it's like. <laughs> right. So they, they felt compelled to answer the question. Um, but the question was not something that was really relevant to what a president or vice president actually does which is you know yeah. set federal policy yeah so that so that distinction between the sort of personal views and the policy and obviously when a president expresses personal views it has policy implications but it is it is striking to me how much of the sort of years between say when obama enters office and this moment it seems like every response to the the question of gay marriage well, a lot of the responses to the question of gay marriage from Obama are about his personal views. And he uses this and he tries to walk this line of like talking about how his personal views are evolving, which just seems like it opens up way more questions than it mm-hmm. than it answers. I'm just curious kind of if that was strategic, if that was genuine, whether that felt like the best, worst argument we can make, given the ways we feel our hands are tied. What's your sense? Yeah, of- I mean, so I, I, I got the sense that that was strategic as a sort of time buying yeah. exercise. You know, the, the the administration did make progress on a number of, of gay rights issues. The first time he uses that, or one of the first times he publicly uses that evolving language is when he's um, talking about uh, don't ask, don't tell repeal, just passing the Senate, um, which was a big policy change that, that the administration maneuvered through in the lame duck session at the end of 2010. Uh, and But there was so much more media attention on marriage than there was on anything else under the LGBT issue umbrella at that point, that he couldn't really ever talk about gay rights without getting challenged on marriage. And then he also couldn't really take a victory lap on on major things like ending the ban on, on military service without getting asked, as he did it at, at that press conference, hey, so you did this thing. Well, now let's talk about like where you're lagging on what the gay rights community wants. And so he said that, I think, as, as trying to you know, some sort of like promissory note without really committing himself and and knowing full well at that point, though, that that the administration was going to drop its defense of the Defense of Marriage Act. And so some of that was that there there was this 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 sort of two track thing going on in the marriage thing, which was that the lawyers were doing almost everything they possibly could to support the legalization of same sex marriage around the country while the president was acting like he was, you know, uh, undergoing this this sort of moral, you mm-hmm. know, wrestling match with himself over over what it meant. And um, the lawyers probably had more impact um, ultimately on, on the course of, of marriage law in the United States than, than anything the politicians said. In, in large part because... You know, Obama and Biden were both chasing public opinion within their own party. I mean, this is this is a, a great example of of leaders following. Um, yeah. You know, there are very few Democratic politicians who came out in favor of same sex marriage when um, it was not already accepted within their core constituencies. 
I also feel like the word evolving is interesting because when I think about um, like Lincoln, for example, and how we talk about how his opinions evolved over slavery, it's this way of, uh, I think, uh, not necessarily admitting a mistake or admitting that you were wrong. It's a way of saying like, oh, I am changing the way I think about things. And it it gives sort of an out a little bit about saying like, oh, yes, of course, people change, people grow, sure. But it doesn't allow people to see you as like a, a Um, solidified in your idea so it doesn't allow them to dig at you as much because you're changing and you're evolving and there's grace within that like evolution and so I feel like a lot of people use that language when they don't want to be pinned down to a particular stance that they know will be toxic. It's a particularly interesting word choice in this moment too or for Barack Obama too because he kind of is devolving <laughs> because back <laughs> yeah. to a position he had held at an earlier period, um, which I think is is one of the reasons why it doesn't. It it always feels a little strategic and a little political. He, he got himself in line with public opinion by two thousand eight, but public opinion kept moving, yeah. um, and he again began to lag behind it. I mean, one of the great ironies is if you go more deeply into that the interview he does on 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 this day. Um, he says at that point, yes, he's comfortable with, with same-sex couples marrying. But he also says, I think this is a matter that should be left for the states and not one in which the federal government should do anything. Um, and two years later, he sends the Solicitor General of the United States before the Supreme Court to argue that state bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional, which is um, totally at odds with what he says in, in the interview with, well, he with evolved. Robin Roberts. He evolved. He never, as best I understand it, explained this publicly. Um, never. And he's a constitutional law professor. And I, I chronicle the meetings he had with, with his solicitor general and, and the counsel's office about each of these times when the when the the administration got involved in, in constitutional litigation over marriage. And they um, thought, you know, very, it got a level of attention from the president that most amicus briefs from the Justice Department do not get. Um, And he made this big change over two years um, and never felt obliged to explain it to to anyone. Yeah. Um, As we start to wrap up, I'm curious two things um, that are related. One, you know, how what was the response like from the activist community that had been fighting for marriage Mm -hmm. equality in this particular moment. I'm assuming lots of calls came into the White House uh, the next day. And then also, you know, your book is about a much wider lens, right? Quarter of a decade fight, um, at least. And so, you know, if you make the list of key moments in that fight, does this even rank? You know, where does this where does this stand? I think the big impact is that it gets Obama to the point where when this is before the Supreme Court, the government of the United States is standing alongside plaintiffs who are challenging discriminatory laws. We see this going back to the Truman and Eisenhower years, the importance at some key moments in civil rights um, litigation to have the Justice Department um, come in and, and, and say that we think that, that state laws are, are and some federal laws are unconstitutional. Um, and I think that it, it carried a lot of weight with um, uh, a court that was risk averse about doing this to see that, you know, that 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 the Justice Department, along with a lot of state governments, had already come to, to this view on their own. The the short-term political impact, um, the uh, to the extent that there had been uh, a concern within the Obama world that there would be backlash to this, uh, it was clear within 12 hours that mm-hmm. there wasn't. Mitt Romney said his first statement sort of a, a, attacks Obama for like a, an opportunistic flip-flop, but then he says, I don't think that this should be an issue in the campaign for any of us doesn't bring it up again that fall there are uh uh you know three presidential debates it's not asked about the 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 front page stories uh the day after the election in the new york times washington post wall street journal don't mention marriage as an issue in the campaign um it it is not something that um uh anybody talks about much the biggest it, a lot of money comes in to the Obama campaign. I think they raised a million dollars that day online. It's, it was their biggest grassroots fundraising day of the year. Hmm. Uh, and, and it takes um, about a month, six weeks for 
um, one shift to reveal itself. There had been polling every month in Maryland uh, because uh, there was a constitutional amendment on marriage on the ballot. And in uh, April, when they polled African-American voters in Maryland, I think the number was like 31 percent uh, supported marriage equality. When In May, uh, when they came back and polled African-Americans in Maryland, 63 percent or something supported marriage equality. The only thing that had changed in marriage politics between April and May of 2012 was that the first African-American president um, had come out and probably in this very personal way talked about his evolution on it. And, um, you know, many people saw uh, uh, African-American communities as, as, as a particular sticking point within the Democratic coalition on gay rights issues. And I think that was a, a, a real significant sort of intra-coalition moment that Obama, you know, made it uh, uh, the safe position to have for, you know, church leaders started to talk differently about it. Uh, that that all sort of changed. And, and I think that that becomes really important because by the end of 2012, um, there's a pro-gay marriage party in the United States and there's an anti-gay marriage party in the United States and where for years before there had been tensions within the Democratic coalition over marriage in the in, in the years after 2012, it's the Republican Party that that experiences the, the problems of, of um, not being unified on this sort of you know hot button yeah. social issue. Um, all right. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, Sasha's book is The Engagement, America's Quarter Century Struggle Over Same-Sex Marriage. Um, and there's lots more details and context in there that is obviously very resonant to many fights still happening right now. But um, Sasha Eisenberg, thank you so much for doing this. This is great. Glad to be with you all. Thanks for having me. And Nicole Hemmer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. I am Vice President of the United States of America. Um, the President sets the policy. I am absolutely comfortable with the fact that men marrying men, women marrying women, and heterosexual men and women marrying women are entitled to the same exact rights, all the civil rights, all the civil liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see much of a distinction uh, beyond that.